This is the Lenovo M93P. It's a boring old office computer, but not for long. Oh hey, <laughs> how you doing? Tech Dweeb here. Thanks for clicking on the video today. And subscribing, that, that's always nice. So yeah, we're gonna turn this boring old office PC into a badass gaming PC. I hope so at least. We're gonna be taking out the guts of this dusty old thing and shoving them into a nice new case. As for the specs, well, this is a Lenovo M93P. It came with an i5-4570 processor, 8GB of 1600MHz DDR3 RAM, a 500GB mechanical hard drive, and a 240W 80 plus bronze rated power supply. This PC cost me 105 bucks on eBay. And of course, we're going to be doing some upgrades along the way. This PC only has 8GB of RAM in it, so we're going to upgrade that to 16GB with this extra 8GB kit of 1600MHz DDDDR3 RAM that I got off eBay for 12 bucks. The PC has a 500GB mechanical drive, which will become our storage drive because we're going to add a fancy new silicon power 256GB SATA SSD. And this cost me 23 bucks. And of course, a GPU. Uh, I'll, I'll show you that later. The first and most important step is adjusting my RGB light bars for dramatic effect. What color should we go with? I think we'll go with plain old white today. Oh hey, what do you think of my new Tech Dweeb shirt? My mom made it for me. Thanks mom. So yeah, my real life Tech Dweeb arms match my virtual Tech Dweeb arms. Alright, so step one is going to be to take this bad boy apart and salvage everything we can for our new build. We'll start by taking off her cover and getting a peek at those juicy insides. Here we have our processor with a heatsink and fan. We'll be reusing all that. Like I said, this is an Intel i5-4570. Not sure how this is going to perform in modern games, but we'll test that out after the build. The motherboard is a proprietary something, Lenovo something. It has a Gen 3 PCIe port for our GPU. It has two free RAM slots, which is nice. Lots of these small form factor PCs only have two RAM slots, so this gives us some upgrade potential. It comes with 8 gigabytes of RAM pre-installed and we'll be upgrading that. Here's our power supply, which is very important because the motherboard is super proprietary and requires this power supply specifically. Here's our hard drive, 500 gigabytes western blue mechanical drive, that'll become our storage drive. All these cables that are in here, we're gonna reuse all this stuff, cause you know, it's perfectly good and we're trying to do this on a budget. We have a fan we could reuse in the front here, I think it's an 80 millimeter fan. Uh, but also we need to take out the temperature sensor, because this motherboard will give you errors if you don't have that. And there's also a little speaker, we'll take that out too, why not? So first things first, we gotta tear this thing apart and get all this stuff ready to take over to our new case. It's all real easy to do. We need to take out all the screws holding the motherboard, unplug all the pluggy plugs from the plug holes. Yeah, you can see here that the SATA power cables are proprietary. They connect to the motherboard for reasons. So we'll need to reuse these. And you can see here our motherboard connection is not standard too. No problem since we're reusing that power supply. Uh, speaking of which, let's take that out. It's not a standard size, but that's okay. We'll find a way to make it work in our case. It actually has this cool looking honeycomb pattern on the outside. I'm gonna try and find a way to show that off in the new build because I, I think it looks kind of neat. And here's our storage drive. There are more proprietary connections here. Our front audio, front USB, and front panel connection are all non-standard. I have a solution for those, however, and I'll show you that in a bit. And there's our motherboard. As you can see, it doesn't have a built-in I.O. shield, so we're going to be taking that from the case and reusing it too. It's pretty easy to take off, you just need to press on the side and then you slide it over. We need to take off this front plastic cover to access the rest of the stuff. Here's our temperature sensor, we'll need that in the new build. And the fan. It's held in there with these little plastic pull tabs, so I'm just going to cut those off. There we go. Pretty good 80mm fan for our new build. Oh, and the speaker too. We're going to grab that. Hey, that's everything we could salvage from the case, I think. I'm gonna th throw this up for free uh, for anyone who wants it on Facebook Marketplace, but it's probably just gonna end up eventually in the dump, to be honest. How much you can do with an old office PC case? <laughs> I can't think of anything to do with it. Oh, hey, I'll leave a comment if you have an idea of what you could use old office PC cases for. <laughs> I'm sure you guys could come up with something fun. Let me introduce you to our case. This is the Golden Field 21 Plus. It's a beautiful little case. I, I really, really like it. I've built many PCs in this case. This is probably number 
I don't know, six or seven, I think. I like it because it's cheap as heck. It's only 43 bucks. It has a real beautiful tempered glass front panel. It's small. It's a micro ATX case, uh, as you can tell by the four PCIe slots, but it's a smaller size, like an ITX case. It's actual brushed metal, and it looks really sharp. It's just very small and simple and sleek and minimalist. It's uh, it's kind of a bit of a torture chamber to work in because it doesn't really have any cable management to speak of. And the power supply mounting is just weird. There's lots about building in this case that sucks. Or should I say, uh, lots of interesting challenges. But I love the final result and I love the price, so that's why we're using this today. Starting by taking the tempered glass side panel off, and we're gonna very slowly, carefully place this over here. Uh-oh. <laughs> that, that joke never gets old, does it? Yeah, it does? Uh, well, uh, too bad? So before we get the motherboard ready, let's put in the IO shield while it's on my mind because I tend to forget about that until it's too late. And oh look, there's a, there's a fan in here. Uh, that, that's because I'm reusing this case from a previous PC build. It was that cheapest gaming computer PC build I did with the Athlon 3000G. Um, I'll link that in the description below if you want to check out that video. This is an 80mm Noctua fan, so I guess we'll just leave that in there, why not? So as for the IO shield, well, it won't just fit. It's not standard, but we can make it fit. See these little tabs at the bottom edge here? We need to bend the, these out about 90 degrees so that they can grip the edge of the IO slot and then this will stay nice and tight. <laughs> and if you're following along at home, I'll warn you right now that this won't work right away. You have to go back and forth, bending and shoving and bending and shoving and crying and bending until you get it to sit in there nice and tight. It's a pain in the buns, but it, it does work in the end, so it's worth the trouble. And once the motherboard's in there, it kind of presses against the IO shield, so it keeps it nice and tight. Okay, let's get our motherboard ready. There's not a whole lot we need to do. We'll start by installing our two 4 gigabyte sticks of DDDDR3 RAM. Okay, that's done. Easy enough. And we could call this done, but I think it's a good idea to replace the thermal paste on the CPU. This PC is like 10 years old at this point, and that thermal paste is probably all dried up and crusty. Giving it some fresh paste will make sure that it won't have thermal issues, and it'll be way easier doing it now while the motherboard is outside of the PC. And yeah, I, I don't think you can tell on camera, but this paste is totally dried up and crusty. I accidentally forgot to film the next part, but I've removed the old paste using a paper towel, and then I added some new paste, and then I shoved the motherboard into the case. So we'll screw this into place using the screws that came with the case, and there we go. Motherboard installed. Now what we need to do is plug in as much as we can before we add the power supply, like our front USB and the front audio, and the panel connectors and SATA cables and all that stuff, because once the power supply goes in, it blocks this side of the motherboard, and it's just way easier to get it done all before. So let's do that now. Do you remember how I mentioned that the front panel connection and the front USB connection and the front audio connection are all proprietary? I want to show you how I'm going to deal with these. Yeah, we can't use any of the connections on the case without some tweaks. In the past, I've made my own adapters using these DuPont cables, which I love just little single cables that have a male and a female end, and you can use these to adapt to any of these connections as long as you know what the pinout is. But this time, I'm gonna do things a little more proper. I got myself this pack of adapters. I found this on AliExpress. It was about eight bucks. These are made specifically for this PC to adapt this motherboard to work with standard connections. So here's USB 2.0. This'll let us plug the standard USB 2 cable from the case into this weird Lenovo motherboard connection. And here's the HD audio, and here's the front panel for the power button, and the power LED and stuff. Let's see if I can do this one-handed to show you. Here's the front panel connection, here's the HD audio connection, and the USB 2.0 connection. Now we just need to plug the cables from the case into the adapters. HD audio, there it is right there. So for our USB, we have a problem. This case has both USB 2.0 and USB 3.0 on the front. I don't have a USB 3.0 adapter. They do make them for this motherboard, but they're like 30 bucks on eBay, so I came up with this. This adapter will let us convert our USB 3.0 connection into a USB 2.0 connection. We'll lose that USB 3.0 speed, but at least it'll work. But that leaves us with another problem. We now have two USB 2.0 connections and only one spot on the motherboard. So that's where this comes in. This is a USB 2.0 connection splitter. 
It'll let us plug in both of these USB 2.0 connections into the one header of the motherboard. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? It's kind of a big tangled mess at the end, which might be an issue considering that this case has no cable management to speak of, but we'll see what we can do about that. And we'll finish up by connecting up our front power button, our front LED, and our hard drive LED. Easy enough. I suppose I should do some preliminary cable management with all of this uh, stuff. Uh, okay, let's see what we can do about this. Hang on a sec. Alrighty, there we go. That, that was pretty painless. This will be tucked away behind the power supply, like the dirty laundry that I shove under my bed when my mom tells me I have to clean my room. That's a tech dweeb life hack right there. All right, uh, let's get through the next stuff quick. Here's the case fan at the back going into the system fan header on the motherboard. Now we need to install our other fan. Here's the fan I have. It's a green fan, not RGB, just G, <laughs> green, only green. So this will be a green build, which sort of works because our motherboard is green. It matches the green light. We want to have the fan at the top intake cool air into the case and the one in the back will exhaust the hot air out the back of the case. Here I am installing the top fan and my camera decided to freak out and go all super bright for some reason. <laughs> Sorry about that ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to tuck lots of these extra cables behind the motherboard. Since I have no real area for cable management, we got to get creative with our cables. Alrighty, um, the next step is to plug in our hard drives. Again, we have some stupid proprietary Lenovo SATA power cables that plug into the motherboard. So let's get them all hooked up. Now, in this case, the only place to mount hard drives is here along the bottom of the case. It has some standard hard drive screw holes that'll hold both our 3.5 inch hard drive and our 2.5 inch SSD. And these cables will just add to the massive bundle of cables that will hopefully be hiding away behind our power supply. So there's our SATA data cables, good to go. Now we just need to mount these hard drives to the bottom here with a few screws, easy stuff. Gonna plug these in first because it's annoying to do afterwards in this case. There we go, hard drive installed. And now we'll do the same for the SSD. And there you go, that's done. Uh, not too shabby. And now we have a bunch more cables to add to the bundle. Uh, awesome. It's the next day now. I got sleepy. Let's finish the build in the bright light of morning. And it probably makes it easier for you to see what we got here. As you can see, we have our hard drive mounted down here. Our SSD over here. Everything's all plugged in. The cable's uh, sort of cable managed. And good enough for now. So it's power supply time. The problem is that the mounting bracket is standard. But our power supply isn't. See, the screw holes, they, they don't line up. So my solution that I've done many times in the past, you guys might have seen me do this before in another video, uh, it goes like this. I have a, a little hunk of metal and this can go on the top and then I'll use some zip ties to tie it nice and tight there. And then that will hold the power supply tight against the bracket. And that should work, in theory. It's worked in the past, so <laughs> let's see how it goes this time. The hardest part of the process is getting the zip ties to go under and through the vent holes at the top of the power supply here. So basically we need to bend these into a hook shape so we can get them in and then back out the other side. It took a few tries, but I got them eventually. Now we just need to pull this tight against the hunk of metal and boom, look at that. Super strong, super secure. That's not going anywhere. Let's plug this in before we mount it inside because once it's in, it's hard to access this stuff underneath. And now we just slide the power supply into place and mount the bracket with the screws. That was uh, pretty painless, actually. Oh, and let's plug in our four pin CPU power while we're at it. The CPU power cable stretches right across the cooler. It's kind of ugly, but you could get a uh, four pin CPU power cable extenders if you want it to be nicer looking. I didn't bother here, <laughs> this, this works fine. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. Oh, you, you haven't been waiting for this? You, you don't even care? Oh, uh, okay. Well, I, I'm gonna tell you anyways. Uh, this is a GTX 1050 Ti. I pulled this from an old iBuy Power pre-built PC. I'm actually going to be showing that off on the channel soon, so uh, get subscribed if you don't want to miss that beauty. This ended up costing me uh, about 110 bucks. It's the 4 gigabyte super clocked bottle, so it should offer much better performance than a 2 gigabyte GPU, but it's not going to knock your socks off or anything. Overall, I'm hoping it'll play the older stuff good and at least run newer stuff, albeit at lower resolutions and frame rates. 
We'll see how it does in a bit. <laughs> oh, uh, this is fun. I forgot to plug in the power supply cable. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, I wonder if I could reach in here and plug it in without removing the power supply. Think I could do it? I don't know, man. It's pretty tight. And... Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, baby. We'll just tuck this cable under the fan and boom, good to go. Oh, wait, I just realized I forgot to plug in the temperature sensor. All right, let's get this guy plugged in and tucked away. Oh, and, and the speaker too. We'll add that since, since we have it. There we go. Now we're good to go. Let's fire this up and give it a test. All right, the moment of truth. Are we going to post? <laughs> let's see. Yeah, lights are on. That's a good sign. And... Um, hmm, why is it making that noise? That's not good. All right, I I'll spare you the epic saga of my troubleshooting. I tried disconnecting the cables and the adapters from the motherboard one at a time, removing the video card, swapping around the fan plugs, disconnecting the drives, trying different RAM configurations. I did figure it out eventually, and I thought it was this RAM kit that I added. Maybe there was some compatibility issue because the computer is booting without it, so it seemed like that was the culprit. But it turns out that that wasn't it. I'll come back to that in a bit. Also, my knock to a fan isn't working. It's not detected by the motherboard. It's giving me a system fan error, even though I know that the fan works. So, I, I don't know what's up with that. I've never had a fan not be detected. They're pretty simple technology, so I can't understand why it wouldn't work. Anyway, we'll just have to swap that out for the fan that came with the Lenovo PC. Lucky that I had that on hand, I guess. And then I had an issue with cloning the hard drive. Since Windows was on the hard drive, I tried to clone it to the SSD using Macrium Reflect, which I've done a thousand times and it usually works. And it sort of worked here, but it was crashing. And then it crashed while I was repairing it. And then it stopped booting entirely. So I just said, screw it and reinstalled Windows from scratch. And now it's night again. And I think we finally, finally all done with this build. And I did actually find out what the main problem was to begin with. It wasn't the RAM kit that I used. It was one of the RAM sticks that came with the PC. One of the four gigabyte sticks. With this in the system, the, the PC boots, but it's not detected. So the system only boots with four gigabytes of RAM. And when this is in the system, the other RAM kit doesn't work. So there's something up with this RAM stick. It's just being weird. It's like borked or something. We're just gonna say screw it and run with three sticks of four gigabytes for a total of 12 gigabytes of RAM. So now we've solved all the problems that got through hell and back to get this thing working. It's time to finally boot this thing up, and check out how it performs in some games. So let's do that now, shall we? I'll show you what it looks like when we boot it up. Uh, there we go. The whole thing lights up with green light and it actually looks, well, it looks freaking awesome in my opinion. And I applied a green wallpaper to make it all matchy matchy. I like to sometimes give my PC builds names. So we're going to call this one the green monster. Alright, so yeah, we're completely up and running. The computer works great. I installed all the drivers and everything went fine. I'll put the prices up on the screen, but the total cost of this build was 305 bucks. So, what kind of gaming performance can you get from a $305 PC? Well, some pretty good performance, actually. It's not going to be amazing. Newer games will struggle a bit, as you'll see, but for the price, you actually get a pretty darn good gaming experience on this thing. Starting off, as always, with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, going with 1080p and the medium preset, we got an average of 39 FPS. I mean, yeah, not amazing, but that's really good. For the price? Yeah, yeah, I'll take that. The last $300 gaming PC that I built was with the Athlon 3000G. And, and granted that that was built with all new parts, and this one is made from the salvaged remnants of a 10-year-old PC that lived its life running dental record software or something, but still, 300 bucks, and we get a gaming PC that can run good-looking games at 1080p medium settings? Yeah, yeah, I'll take that any day. And here's The Witcher 3, a, a bit of an older game, but still a great looking game, and a, a great game in general. One of my favorite games of all time, in fact. It's a more intensive older game, too. Again, we're running at 1080p, medium preset, but with high textures to make a good use of that 4 gigabytes of VRAM, and we get 50 FPS average by the end of my gaming test, and that's good. That's really good. This game was so intensive when it came out. I, I should be used to it now, but it, it, it still kind of blows my mind whenever it runs good on a, a cheap gaming PC. And you can tell the game looks awesome. No issues whatsoever on this setup. 
Same thing with Far Cry 5. This is running at 1080p with a high preset this time. We got 48 FPS by the end of my test. This is another game that looks great, but it's super well optimized and runs really well on a wide range of systems. I think our four gigabytes of VRAM is a big help for these big open world games with tons of textures and stuff. As you can see by the stats on the screen, we're getting pretty high CPU usage. So our i5-4570 is pretty much pushed to its limit on these older games. So let's see how it handles some more modern stuff. Let's try some God of War. Running at 1080p with a low preset and balanced FSR. At the same, the game still looks great at these settings, but it, it doesn't run great, to be honest. Our average FPS is fine. We're in the 50s, but look at that frame time graph and the 1% lows. Our CPU usage is, is maxed out and our GPU usage isn't, which means that yeah, the, the CPU will be our bottleneck, especially in more modern games. So while it may be a fine experience FPS-wise, th those inconsistencies, you can, you can really feel them when you're playing. Don't get me wrong, the game is playable, but it's definitely not as nice playing when the game doesn't feel smooth and responsive. This one I definitely wanted to test. It's Deathloop, which is a new game, and is currently the only game that has implemented FSR 2.0. I made a whole video on FSR 2.0. I'll, I'll link that in the description if you want to check it out to learn more. Uh, the short answer is that FSR 2.0 is upscaling that looks as good as DLSS, but it runs on any GPU. So here we are in Deathloop, running at 1080p with a low preset, FSR 2.0 enabled and set to performance, and well, yeah, it's running. It's not doing too bad. The The frame times are kind of all over the place. So, so again, it doesn't feel like the smoothest experience in the world. But considering FSR 2.0 is said to require at least a GTX 1070, <laughs> I think I'm kind of breaking the rules by running it on a 1050 Ti. But <laughs> hey, it, it is working. It is playing just fine. I forgot to turn on the FPS counter, but I think we're getting around 45 FPS on average here. The frame rate spikes aren't so bad that it's super distracting or anything. This is actually pretty promising that FSR 2.0 can run on a 1050 Ti and give us a really good looking gaming experience. On a $300 gaming PC, I might add. Uh, surely, you have to agree that this is some pretty good bang for the buck gaming. <laughs> and finally, the most demanding, system melting, GPU exploding game in the known universe. It's Cyberjog 207077. Running at 1080p, with the medium preset, and well, yeah, it runs. You could play like this. 41 FPS by the end of my run. 1% lows are pretty bad, but it's not a stuttery mess or anything. It's getting by. You could play like this and have fun. You can also drop down the settings to the low preset or go down to 900p resolution or something to get more FPS. <laughs> but hey, we should be used to this by now. Cyberjunk brings systems to their knees. I think this i5-4570 and GTX 1050 Ti, I think they're putting up a pretty good effort here. Good job, guys. Yay! And that brings us to the end. I'm really curious to know what you guys think of this one. Do you like it? Have you ever done a case swap? Do you think that this sort of gaming performance is worth the price and the time and the effort? <laughs> Frankly, I'm just happy to have a use for old computers that keeps them out of the dump, to be honest. But I know lots of people think that upgrading old office PCs is the best way to get up a gaming on a budget. So speak up and let me know what you think in the comments below. And while you're down there, click the thumbs up button if you like the video or the thumbs down button if you hate it. Subscribe so you don't miss any of my videos. As always, I'm TechDweeb, thanks for watching. Bye bye